I titled the message this morning, Walking in Unity. Does the body of Christ need more unity? What's the answer? Isn't it sad, especially now with social media, that you'll see people bickering over secondary issues to the point that their testimonies are blown with the world? Amen? We're the body of Christ. The churches that meet down the road, we're all one church, we just meet in different buildings. Can we say amen to that? And so we're all on the same side, with the same heart and the same passion. We should be just as excited when someone gets saved at the Presbyterian Church down the street or at Calvary Community as if they give their life to the Lord here. We're not trying to build this church. We want to build the kingdom of God. And we need to walk in unity. And we're going to see the two biggest obstacles to unity we're going to see in the chapter this morning. The first one is legalism. Now, what is legalism? It's self-righteously turning a personal conviction into a requirement for salvation for everyone else. And the legalist thinks he's the most spiritual. Amen? I keep all these rules. You know what that reminds me of? The Pharisees. Remember the Pharisees in Jesus' day wearing the black robes, tithing their mint and cumin? Literally, they're taking their spices out and tithing. Nine, ten, nine spices, nine peppers for me, one pepper for God. I mean, they're straining on a gnat. They're doing all that. At the same time, the Messiah is standing in front of them, and they miss him. Guys, you can be religious and lost. Amen? You can be very legalistic and not know the Savior. And often, with legalism, comes a lack of joy. Amen. Can we say amen to that? Where you walk around and you're a sin sniffer and pointing fingers at everybody else all the time. And, and, you, and you know what? And a personal conviction is a good thing. Let me give the balance here. God's personally convicted me of things that I know if I disobey it, for me it would be sin, it would be wrong. But it doesn't necessarily mean that God convicted you. There's certainly, there's sin that's well defined that we need to obey. Can we say amen to that? The word of God is true. But if God puts a conviction on your heart to never watch TV again, because maybe for you it's just taking up your life and you just feel conviction from God to, to turn your TV off, get rid of your cable and move on. That's fine, that's between you and the Lord and you should obey that. But when you go around telling everybody if you have a TV you're going to hell, that's a problem. That's called legalism, amen? It's where I take a personal conviction and I make a prerequisite for salvation for everyone else. One of the big ones I've seen a lot of in churches. You know, the church I pastored in Santa Cruz grew very large, and there would be groups that believed if you didn't homeschool your kids, you were in sin. Then there are people that believed if you didn't send your kids to Christian school, you were in sin. And then there are people who believed if you didn't send your kids to public school so they could be a witness to people at the public school, you were in sin. So you had three groups of people that all were self-righteous and thought they were right. And guess what? If God convicts you to homeschool your kids, homeschool your kids. If God puts it on your heart to send your kids to Christian school, send them to Christian school. And if God has, puts it on your heart to send your kids to public school, send them to public school. And guys, everyone be convinced in their own mind to be obedient to the Lord. Can we say amen to that? Amen. It's not my job to tell you how God desires for you to be faithful to the convictions he's placed on your heart. Now look, in the essentials of the faith, there can be no wavering. Jesus is God. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus rose from the dead. He's the only way to heaven. He's coming back. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Those are unwavering. Those are non-negotiables. The negotiables are the things where legalism can kick in and division comes in the body of Christ where it should not take place. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Not Jesus plus baptism, not Jesus plus tithing, not Jesus plus reformed theology, not Jesus plus hymns, not Jesus plus the first Holy Communion, not Jesus plus homeschooling, not Jesus plus KJV only, not Jesus plus the Saturday Sabbath. Can we say amen to that? And no, I'm not saying those things are necessarily all wrong. The point is that we don't add to the cross of Calvary. And praise God for that. So the first thing, be, be faithful to what the Holy Spirit convicts you to do without making it a barometer for everyone else's faith. This is what causes division in the body of Christ. Isn't it sad that there are churches that divide with other churches because we meet on a different day of the week? Really? That's sad, amen? Grieves the heart of God. Second thing, here's the opposite extreme, legalism. The other one's liberty or license. Legalism is where 
You strain at every rule and you make every rule and conviction you have the law for everyone else. Liberty is, well, I'm, li- I'm free in Christ. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace, so I can do whatever I want. And I don't care if me doing whatever I want causes someone else to stumble. That's wrong and it's sin. Can we say amen to that? We need to be mindful to minister to the weaker brother, the weaker sister, to not allow our liberty to cause someone else to stumble. By the way, I'm not preaching the whole message right now if you're new. I tell you what I'm gonna tell you, then I'll tell you, then I'll tell you what I told you, amen? Amen. Right? Prepare you for what's coming, We'll we'll go in depth. But allowing personal liberty to become a stumbling block Apostle Paul said, look, if me eating meat, paraphrase, if me eating meat is going to stumble my brother, I'll never eat meat again. Guys, are we allowed to eat meat? What's the answer? Yes. Yes. But if I'm going over to uh, someone's house and I know they're uh, vegan and I know it would stumble them, I'm not bringing prime rib. (laughs) Amen? And it could be something, you know, alcohol. Here's another issue. Do you have the freedom as a Christian to have a glass of wine with dinner? Yes. Yes. Okay. Me personally, as a pastor, I'm convicted in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that pastors are not to drink alcohol, period. Okay? And I don't, and none of our pastors do. And if you see them drinking alcohol, let me know. They're fired. <laughs> Jesus, being legalistic. No. No, the point I'm making, though, is, but if, I won't even drink a non-alcoholic beer. I won't drink, why? Because I know that many people look to me as an example. And I know if somebody walks into a Mexican restaurant and I'm sitting there with a virgin margarita or daiquiri or something, they don't know. And if I drink that, then this person who maybe struggled with alcoholism their whole life says, well, if the pastor can do it, I can do it. I'm not gonna use my liberty to stumble somebody else. Does that make sense? And as believers, we need to be mindful and sensitive to that Whatever that area may be, I just picked a couple examples. There's many others where you know that if I do this, I'm gonna stumble somebody else. It's not about the external, it's about the eternal. It's not about me having my flesh satisfied, it's about me living my life. I I get frustrated, being real transparent. I get frustrated, I see pastors posting themselves with a beer in their hand, smoking a cigar, and they put it on Facebook. And I'm like, bro, I have liberty. Bro, you're stumbling people. Amen? Amen? Be an example. And again, I'm not trying to be a sin. If, if you like to smoke cigars at your house, you drink beer once a while, that's between you and the Lord. And if you don't have a conviction about that, that's between you and the Lord. Can we say amen to that? I don't want to violate the very legalism I'm about to preach on. Amen? I don't want to do that. Okay? But here's the thing. We're going to walk in unity if we don't put everybody else on our standard and point fingers at everybody else that doesn't live exactly the way that we do. Now, again, in the essentials, we don't waver. Let me make that really clear. We don't waver. We don't water down the Word of God. Can we say amen to that? But in the non-essentials, as I wrote here in the bottom of the notes, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Amen? Amen? So let's begin there in Romans 14. Looking at verse 1. By the way, unity has been a problem in the body of Christ since it began. If you read the letters written by the Apostle Paul, he's almost always dealing with division in the church. So there's nothing new under the sun. Guys, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Can we say amen? It's been said that blood is thicker than water. The Holy Spirit is thicker than blood. When you have Jesus in common, you have everything in common. You guys are my family, I love you, I pray for you every week, and I feel like every Sunday and every Thursday is a family reunion, amen? Amen. So we love each other, we we need to have unity, we need to care for each other, serve each other. Our relationship with other believers should be an encouragement to them and a testimony to the world. Can we say amen to that? People should look and say, man, the Bible says they shall know us by the, by our fruit, but also by the love we have one for another. Both of those are true. And so, Almost every local church mentioned in the New Testament had contentions and divisions. The Corinthian church divided over human leaders. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of, you know, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. I know who I'm of on that list. I'm of Jesus, amen? amen. But they're dividing over which per- I'm of Calvary Chapel, I'm of uh, this church, I'm of that church. Guys, I'm of Christ, how about you? Not going to be a Calvary Chapel section and a Baptist section and a Presbyterian section in heaven. Amen? We're all one family. In Galatians, they were biting and devouring one another, it says. 
It says in Ephesians and Colossians, they had to be reminded of the importance of Christian unity. And in Philippians, two women were at odds with each other. And as a result, they were splitting the church. Guys, unity. Amen? We're family. Love each other. Serve each other. Lay down our lives for each other. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell in unity. Lack of unity in the church is not a result or a lack of God's grace, but man's pride, ignorance, and spiritual immaturity. Can we say amen to that? I just went through this with a church I'm very familiar with. My son-in-law is the pastor, and there was some division in the church over nonsense. Somebody moved a bookcase, and people were leaving the church. Somebody repainted the foyer, and people were leaving the church. Somebody took down a poster off the wall, and people were leaving the church. That's ridiculous. Can we say amen to that? We've lost our way when we get our eyes on the temporary stuff. Do you know what? The only thing we're taking to heaven with us is people. Amen? Amen? And Lord, help us. While as Christians, there are absolute essentials that are non-negotiable, we need to be charitable in the things that are non-essential. Let's begin there in verse 1 of Romans chapter 14, looking at walking in unity, ministering to the weaker brethren. It's going to be interesting to see how Paul defines the weaker brother. It's probably not going to be what you think. And as we look at this, I pray for all of us that we would apply it to us as a fellowship, to us as individuals, and to us as those who minister to each other. You know, again, we want to reach this city for Jesus. Can we say amen to that? Does Calabasas need the Lord? Can we say amen to that? And guys, we're not going to reach him by fighting with each other. We're not going to reach him by being self-righteous. We're going to reach him recognizing we're one beggar leading another beggar to the bread. Look at verse 1 of Romans 14. It says, Receive one who is weak in faith, but do not dispute over doubtful things. Don't dispute over doubtful things. Don't dispute over secondary issues. Guys, we can have a discussion, a theological discussion about things, but it should be done in love. Can we say amen to that? And we can agree to disagree on secondary issues. Uh, The tribulation. Are we pre-trib, min-trib, post-trib, or pan-trib? It'll all pan out when he comes back. Calvary Chapel, we're pre-trib. To me, there's not a doubt in my mind what the Bible teaches. God has not appointed us under wrath. He's going to snatch the church away. But I have Christian brothers who are mid-trib. You know what? It's a non-essential. Can we say amen to that? We're on the same team. We agree to disagree. We have kind discussions over lunch, and we walk away going, I'm still kind of where I am. And you'll find out it's pre-trib when you get raptured. Don't worry about it, right? But the reality is that we can fight over non-essentials, but notice the word here, it says receive. In the Greek, it means to take to oneself, to lead, to admit uh, friendship and hospitality, to embrace and enjoy them without passing judgment on areas where they don't see, where we don't see eye to eye. Guys, we shouldn't look at a new believer and expect them to be as spiritually mature as someone who's been walking with the Lord for 35 years. Can we say amen to that? I remember a guy that got saved at Calvary Chapel, Santa Cruz. He came from a pretty rough background. Somebody brought him to church. He was a rough guy. And he would come up to me. He came up to me one week after service, and he goes, Pastor Dave, that was a great effing message. (laughs) He's new. (laughs) Let's love him. (laughs) Let's keep teaching him the Bible. And God will take care of that. Amen? Could have said, oh, drag him outside, you know. (laughs) No. People who are new believers or weaker in their faith, we shouldn't be surprised when they act like it, okay? And I want people to feel welcome to love. Now, I'm not going to water down the message. And over time, you know, at one point, he and I were out at a barbecue one time, and I go, hey, bro, Language is kind of an issue for you, huh? And he goes, yeah, Pastor Dave, pray for me. I said, I'll pray for you. He goes, I'm sorry I do that. I said, bro, it's okay. I said, I'm just glad you're here. And, and, and now you feel convicted about your language, right? He goes, yeah, I feel convicted. I say it and I feel bad. So that's the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen? So he's saying receive them with love. You know, receive the weaker brother. Don't go, oh, well, look at her. She's, look at her. Look at the way she's dressed. Or look at the way the guy talks. And look at the way that person acts. And we can have that mentality. And guys, we're not to be sin sniffers. We're to be people who love people. This is not a police station. It's a hospital. 
People don't come here to get beat up, they come here to be loved and welcomed and encouraged and strengthened in the most holy faith. Can we say amen to that? So he says there, one who is weak in the faith. There are many reasons why people can be weak. Number one, they're a new believer, babes in Christ. Hey, I have five grandsons. One of my grandsons is a year old. I don't expect him to lift stuff. Amen? He's a baby. He's not super strong yet. He doesn't, you know what I mean? He doesn't have that ability. I don't have expectations on him because he's a baby. And the same is true with someone who's a, now we want to see people grow and we're not condoning sinful behavior, but we want to understand that. There's others who've maybe gone to a fellowship where they've never been taught the Bible. Maybe they've been a Christian for 15, 20 years, but they're still babies in their faith because they've never really studied the Bible. Maybe they've been going to a place where it's just a religious ritual that they go through every week and they go home and nothing changes. They never crack their Bible open. They don't really spend time in prayer. And you know what? You can be a baby for 20 years. Amen? So that person can be weak in their faith. Um, not been fed. They may lack exercise. You know what? You know how you get strong? You exercise, amen? And if you don't spend time in the Word and spend time in prayer and spend time seeking the Lord, you're not going to grow spiritually. And so there's a lot of reasons why people can be, you know, weak in their faith. And it doesn't necessarily just based on time. I've known people that have been, my dad used to say, got saved real good. Amen? Guy's been saved a year and he's on fire. Saved real good. Amen? And there's people that give their life to the Lord and nothing seems to change for a long time. And so when you accept the weaker brethren in, again, we need to love them enough to put our arm around them. God's going to give us opportunities to speak into their life. And we don't want to be shy about that. But we also don't want to be so condemning that people never want to be in fellowship again. Can we say amen to that? We need to love people and be kind. It says, do not dispute over doubtful things. Again, not so that you might debate them uh, not so that you might debate them on non-essentials and place where, you know, where, places where you don't see eye to eye. Don't put your focus there on a non-essential. And the guys who think they're spiritually mature, a lot of times, especially our church in Santa Cruz got really big, and there'd be people that had pet theology. And they would grab a new believer and put him over in a corner, and I could see him over there in a the corner doing this. And the guy's been there for an hour, right? He's new. You go over, bro, what are you doing? Leave him alone. Amen. And there's this mentality, well, what do you think? Do you think you should worship on Saturday or Sunday? Which day do you think is the Sabbath? And bro, relax. Amen? Let everyone be convinced in their own mind. Rather than embrace them and love them and minister to them, the love and uh, that's what God's called us to do. Don't debate them over non-essentials, but love them. Embrace them. Minister to them. The love and grace and the truth of the word of God. Be the moon. Reflect the sun. Amen? That as over time they are loved and welcomed and taught, they might grow spiritually into mature, healthy believers in Christ. Don't expect an infant to act like an, an adult. And then be so hard on them that they leave and never come back. People get blown out of the church, not because of Christ, but because of people. Can we say amen to that? I've got notes here, and I've got them in Santa Cruz, and I love it when I get them. People have written it on the thing. I, I visited your church today, I'm from out of the area, and I've never felt so welcomed and loved at a church in my life. That ought to be the standard. Can we say amen to that? And God bless you guys for that. Let's make people feel welcomed and loved. Guys, if we receive them, and then attack and debate them on non-essential about doubtful things, we may win the battle, but we're gonna lose the war. I'm, more, I'm far more concerned about where your eternity is than whether or not you agree with me on pre and post trip. Can we say amen to that? And so his point he's making here is, look, here's the doctrine, here's how we respond, let's walk in unity. I'm learning more and more to love people and minister to them and not debate them all the time. Can we say amen to that? If you walk away saying that guy loves me more than he was right about that argument, I'll take it. Can we say amen? And too often I think we're so focused on being right on being arrogant and I've got the answers and you'll understand once you become as smart as me mentality. That's the Pharisees, amen? We need to love each other and be kind. Again, I'm not saying to water down the truth. Don't ever think that's the case. And again, do not automatically attack a weak brother's belief position on the doubtful things, but instead love them, minister to them that they might grow spiritually. Verse two, for one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. <laughs> I 
Now this is a doubtful thing, and this is not a verse to pick on our vegan and vegetarian friends. Although I, I mess with Josh with that one every once in a while. <laughs> our resident buff vegan up here in the front. This has nothing to do with that. I mean, again, here's what he's saying. In Paul's day, there was a debate about things that had been offered to idols as to whether you could eat them or not. And some felt a liberty that they could go take sacrifices that were sacrifices to idols, because to them, idols were just stones anyway, and it doesn't matter. So what, he would, what they would do is some would go buy the meat that was offered to idols because it was cheaper. And then there were others who would say, I'm not eating that, that was offered to an idol. And he's saying that some will say, look, I'm only gonna eat vegetables. I'm not even gonna get anywhere near that. And then there's others who felt like they can eat everything. Now the weaker brethren in this case is actually the one who believes that if he eats something, it's going to condemn him. The Bible tells us it's not what we put in our mouth that condemns us, it's what comes out of our mouth. Can we say amen to that? And so the point of this verse right here is really that there are those who say, well, I only eat this, and I'm very strict on this, and I have this diet, and anybody who doesn't is in sin. Well, no. That's actually the weaker brother who takes that position, okay? Now, that being said, if I'm someone who likes meat, and I do. <laughs> Four-footed dead animal, thank you, Jesus. Amen? But that being said, I would never allow my diet to stumble somebody. Can we say amen to that? Even if that person's weaker and they say, I'm only going to eat this and don't, you know, if I was in that day, I wouldn't bring meat sacrificed to an idol to a guy's house who I knew had a problem with that. Don't do that. Can we say amen to that? And so we want to be sensitive and focus on people, not on my ability to have liberty. So even though that's the weaker brother, and even though he can be being legalistic about it, on whether or not they could eat meat sold in the market that had been offered to idols. Again, saying, well, you know, it's not kosher. And again, it's against those who, because of their own personal conviction, attempt to lay a burden of legalism upon all who do not believe the same way they do. Because some Christians saw nothing wrong with the meat. Again, Acts 10, rice, kill and eat. What God has cleansed, let no man call unclean. By the way, that verse is not also a pro-meat eating verse, even though it's there. It's really bringing the Gentiles and the Jews together because they had different diets. And he said, from now on, that diet's gone because we're all one in Christ. Amen? So we don't have to have kosher dishes anymore, amen? We don't have to, people choose to, and if they do, that's okay, let them. I mean, don't fight over disputeful things, amen? Doubtful things. And so, in Paul's mind, the weaker brother is the stricter one. The weaker because of their rigid, judgmental, and legalistic attitudes, and a lack of love towards others. I've been invited to people's homes, and I don't drink alcohol, but you know, sometimes, you know, they have a lot of alcohol on the table. I don't condemn them. That's between them and the Lord. Amen? I don't have any, and that's okay. And I'm not stumbled by it. That's okay. But again, if I were someone who drank alcohol and I was going to someone's house who I knew didn't, the last thing I would do is bring some. Can we say amen to that? So do you understand the point is that we need to care about people, not our liberty, nor our, our being legalistic. That's the whole point of this entire chapter. Again, the self-righteous legalist often appears to be more holy, looking down on meat eaters, right? Paul describes them as weaker brothers who haven't fully grasped the grace of God. And so praise God for the, just the simplicity of the word of God. We can be so engaged in political debates, theological hair splitting, turning personal conviction into legalistic standard for everyone, that we miss God's heart. I want you to walk away, I would hope we would all want people to walk away from our, our, our conversation feeling the love of God, not the condemnation of men. Amen. Can we say amen to that? Saying, well, you know, that person loves me. And okay, we disagree, but we can have a civil conversation and we can be kind and loving to each other. And boy, we blow that on social media sometimes. Can we say amen? amen. Get fired up. How dare you write that? You're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. You know what? Pray for him before you respond. Can we say amen to that? Legalism has a way of making us think we are strong and those who don't keep our rules as weak. Verse 3, let him who eats, 
Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. So he's saying, look, so if you have a conviction to eat only vegetables, don't condemn the guy that eats meat. If you're the guy that eats meat, don't mock the guy that eats only vegetables. Can we say amen to that? This is a non-essential. We're not talking about the cross. We're not talking about the resurrection. We're talking about an issue that someone has a personal conviction. Don't be legalistic. Simply accept and receive one another in love. If God has convicted someone about eating meat, that person shouldn't eat meat, but he shouldn't assume that God has convicted everybody in the same way. Amen? So you guys be faithful, each of us. If you have a, an opinion on scripture that the rest of the church needs to know, then let them see it in how you live. Amen? Amen? You don't have to put up billboards and go on their Facebook page and rip them every time they're doing something contrary to your personal conviction. As they see the belief and conviction conform you into the image of Christ, they'll be attracted to want to know more. Meanwhile, don't try to force your opinions on others or insist they do things the way you do. Most people caught up in legalism feel it's their job to let everyone know uh, and get in line with their convictions, and, and usually they have little to no joy. Most of you know I have a brother who, who has a different theological position than me. And uh, he, every conversation we have on the phone, we go to the, he, he wants to get to that point as fast as he can and debate me some more. And I'm like, why? We're going we're gonna to agree to disagree. He's a Calvinist, I'm not. I believe that men have free will. He doesn't. Okay. Why do you want to keep debating me about this? Let's go hand out tracks on the beach. <laughs> Amen? Because... What will happen is we'll get so battling with each other over secondary issues that we'll be having little impact on the kingdom of God. I'm more concerned about seeing people saved than convincing somebody else who's already saved about a theological position I hold. Amen? It says there, who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Who are you to judge another servant? By the way, I'm not, your, I'm not your servant in that sense. I'm called to serve you, but I'm God's servant. And I'm accountable to him. Can we say amen to that? Now, we are to serve each other, but ultimately, the one that we're accountable to is the Lord. Paul reminds us that it isn't our place to pass judgment on fellow Christians. They will stand or fall before their own master. Now there's balance. Matthew 18 says if you see your brother in sin, you should love them enough to come alongside them. Don't tell the whole church. Don't put it on Facebook. Don't run an ad in the newspaper. Go to your brother one-on-one -on -one and say, hey, bro, I've seen this. This is concerning. I heard this. I got a phone call or somebody told me this. I'm concerned because I love you. I come to you one-on-one. -on -one. I want to share my heart with you. I want to help you in this. Can we say amen to that? That's appropriate. And it's not self-righteous and condemning and judgmental. It should happen with love and grace. Desiring not to destroy somebody or be self-righteous, but to draw them back to a right relationship with the Lord. Can we say amen to that? So that is absolutely true. And, you know, because here's the, here's the mantra of every atheist. Judge not lest ye be judged. That's in your Bible. <laughs> and that judgment is talking about, and it's in, it's in Matthew, or it's actually, in Acts, it's actually, yeah, it's in Matthew 7, where the Lord talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount. But when he's talking about that, he's talking about the fact that I can't look at someone and judge their eternal salvation. I can't just look at you and say, you're going to fry in hell, bro. You're, you know, that's not my call. That's God's call. Can we say amen to that? But what I can do is love someone enough to say that behavior is outside of God's will. And again, do it in love and in grace. Can we say amen to that? Amen. And the guy that tells you, don't be judging me, is someone who says, I want to live my life the way I want. I don't believe in God anyway. And don't tell me how to live my life. That's code. That's what that's code for. Amen? So pray for them. Pray for them. That God will soften their hearts and open their eyes. Adultery, drunkenness, drug abuse, sin addressed by the body to bring restoration. We bring it to somebody to restore them, not destroy them. Amen? And that should be our heart. If that's the heart, people receive that. Conviction on non-essentials. God will judge his servants' obedience to the convictions he has given them. And God is able to make them stand. Person uh, you can't stand or don't understand, God will make them to stand. 
I'm gonna stand before God one day. We're gonna talk about that in a moment, and so will you, and we'll be accountable before him. Verse five, one person esteems one day above another, another esteems another day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. Controversy first, he talks about diet, now he's talking about days of worship. The church I pastored in Santa Cruz, we met in a seventh day at Venice Church. We actually met in their gymnasium, and it was a huge gymnasium, probably four times, five times the size of this room, and it was full of people, and praise God for the seven-day Adventists because they don't use their buildings on Sunday. <laughs> I wish we had some seven-day Adventists in Calabasas, but we don't. And there are some seven-day Adventists that go to an extreme. Uh, one of their prophets taught if you meet on Sunday, you've taken the mark of the beast. Now, fortunately, the school we met at, the guy who ran it was a Christian, and he didn't believe that. And when they got a new principal, he called me in he's with my assistant and said, do you guys think we're a cult? And my assistant was like, oh no, we're gonna meet on Sunday, oh no, we're gonna meet on Sunday. And I said, if you believe the teachings of Ellen G. White that I've taken the mark of the beast and that you're the only true believers, then yes, I do believe you're a cult. He goes, well, I don't believe that. I said, well, praise the Lord, we're good. Amen? Guys, why do we worship on, the, the Jews worshiped on Saturday, that's the Sabbath, amen? Why do Christians tend to worship on Sunday? Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. Resurrection day. But do you know we can worship God every day? And we should be worshiping God every day. Amen? We had a, we've had a, I think it was a while back, we had a Sunday we couldn't meet here, we met on a Saturday. Oh no, we can do that. It's okay. He's saying, look, don't allow diet and don't allow the day of the week that you meet to cause division in the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. This seems so simple, but people fight about it. And they want to argue about it. Let's get our eyes on Jesus. In the New Testament, Christians gather on the first day of the week, and Paul told the Corinthians to bring their offerings together on the first day of the week. And again, because of the resurrection of our Savior. Some today believe that if you go to church on Sunday, as I said, that you're outside of God's will. You know what? I believe every day is the Lord's day. I do believe this. I do believe we should set aside a day that we don't work and we make that day focused entirely on the Lord. Can you say amen to that? Now that's a pastor day personal conviction. Okay? Some, oh, I worked on Sunday. Oh no, I'm going to hell. No, I didn't say that. But I do think it's important to spend some time, take some time to specifically focus on your relationship with God. Amen? I grew up in the Baptist church. My dad was a Baptist pastor. And man, Sunday was a day. Got to, we had Sunday school and then we had church. And then you had people over for roast. I think Baptist, it was like in the bylaws. You got to have roast for, for lunch. So you put a roast in the oven and you bring a bunch of people over from church. And after you have the roast, you go back for Sunday night church. And all day was about the Lord. And you know, and some people go, that's a lot. I, you know, I kind of miss it. Because you know what? Is God worth giving them a whole day? <laughs> Amen? Some of us are like, it's 1131, shut up. <laughs> Don't you know football starting in a few weeks? Quickly. And we have a mentality. Guys, God needs to be the priority. Amen? Amen. But he says there, let each be fully convinced in their own mind. So if someone's convinced they should worship on Saturday, but they believe the rest of the doctrine we believe, God bless you, bro, that's great. Praise the Lord. I'm good with it. Amen? Let's not debate over non-essentials. Verse 6. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not, eats to the Lord, does not eat, and gives God thanks. All you do, do it as unto the Lord, thanking God and doing it all in obedience to Him, His Word and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Guys, you cannot use conscience as an excuse for... uh, obvious sinful behavior you can't say well i'm not convicted so it's okay holy spirit will convict you you will have convictions i don't have i have convictions you i have convictions today i didn't have five years ago can anybody say amen to that things you used to do as a believer and you were okay with it and then god convicted you over time you know like you know what i don't think i need to be doing that i think i need to let that go 
and, and God does that, changes your heart over time. And that's between you and the Lord. And you be obedient to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, look, let each one be you know, convicted in their own mind about his diet, about the day a week that they meet. If they're doing it as unto the Lord, then praise the Lord. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're not going to fight about that. Can we say amen? And that's what he's saying here. Then he says in verse 7 and 8, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Amen. That verse is underlined in my Bible. If that's your Bible in your lap, I would encourage you to underline that verse. Guys, ultimately, when it comes right down to it, we are the Lord's. Amen? And I want to live every day for the Lord. I want to live every day to honor the Lord. I want to give praise to the Lord. We live for the Lord. The Lord is living in us. In dying, we should glorify the Lord. We had a worship leader at Calvary San Jose when I was a youth pastor there back in the 90s. And he got cancer. And he led worship all the way up till the day before he died. And we watched him shrinking away. I think he had pancreatic cancer. It was pretty gnarly. And he watched this man shriveling up. And the thing that I loved about him, he wasn't very old. He was younger than I am right now. He was probably, in a, probably 50. And he said to me one day, he said, Pastor Dave, I just want to glorify God in my dying. I thought, wow. He said, I'm going to heaven. I'm getting there before you. How about that? <laughs> and he had the right heart that I want to do everything I do to honor God even in the way I die. Amen? Christians die well. Amen? Because we don't die, we move to a much better neighborhood. Amen? We close our eyes on earth, we open them up in glory. And the point he's making is, look, it's about people. And we want to live our lives to honor God in all that we do. We want to honor him in what we say and how we treat people. Being his now, we want to live for him. I don't live to be approved for the approval of men, I live for faithfulness to God. Amen? Amen? Now, I don't want to live in a way, again, to stumble my brother by things that I choose to do, but I want to live in a way that honors the Lord, even if it means that some men may be offended. We need to have an eternal perspective, amen? I can't wait to get to heaven, verse 10. It says there, verse nine, excuse me. For to, to this end, Christ died and rose again, rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. He's the Lord of the dead and the living. Most of you guys know my dad went to heaven a, a year ago last week. Praise the Lord. Uh, one year anniversary, I was on the phone with my, my sister and we were sharing memories about my dad and I miss him every day. I'm so happy for my dad. He's doing better than all of us. Amen? I miss him every day, but boy, do I have peace. And I can't wait to see him again. And, and man, my dad's singing at the top of his lungs because he was like that here. Amen? And you know what? The Lord died for us that we might have life and life more abundant, amen? And that we might have peace in death. Jesus lived that we might have life and he died in our place that we might have victory over sin and death because of what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary, amen? Guys, that's where the focus belongs, not you guys meet on Saturday, what's wrong with you? You don't homeschool your kids? Dude, I'll pray you get saved. And there's this mentality over secondary issues that are such non-essentials that bring division to the body. There are people that stop going to church because people argue with them about non-essentials. Amen? Amen? Preach the truth. Do it in love. Be kind. Verse 10. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Who's he talking to here? Christians, this pops a cap in people. I thought we weren't going to be judged. Are we going to be judged for our sin before the Lord? What's the answer? No. 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 We're forgiven. Can we say amen to that? I stand before him clean to the shed blood of the lamb. Amen? Jesus, he's with me. She's with me. Amen? We're forgiven. Is there a judgment for believers, yes. yes. This is called the Bema Seat Judgment. And we will all stand before God one day and be accountable for how faithful we've been with the gifts he's given us and what we've done with the calling he's placed upon our lives. And you know what, the Bible even talks about that he will give us rewards. This blows me away, how about you? 
So he saves me, he shows me mercy, he shows me grace, he doesn't give me what I deserve, he gives me stuff I don't deserve, he then gives me gifts, and then because I simply use what he has given me, he's gonna give me rewards. Now I'll be honest with you, I don't live every day thinking about the rewards, maybe I should, I don't. I live every day just thinking about my Savior. Amen? And most believe, and I'm in this group, that I believe that he's gonna give us crowns, and I believe those crowns are coming right back at his feet. Amen? You know, you've been faithful, and he gives it to you, and you say, Lord, I'm giving that right back to you. Amen? But he's letting them know, we don't need to judge how faithful someone is with the gifting God's given them. God will judge them for that. We do want to address somebody who's not saved. You want to love them and encourage them and point them to the cross. If someone's living in open, sinful behavior, we want to address that like Matthew 18 in kindness and love and mercy, pulling them aside, not ripping them. But we also want to know that we will be judged by the Lord. Don't show contempt for your brother. The judgment seat, again, is the Bema seat equivalent to judges' seat in the Olympic Games. It's like the race has been won, you're standing before the judge and he gives you, you know, the gold medal. And this is what this seat is like. You stand before God and like I said, I'm just gonna be happy I'm there. How about you? I'm in heaven, I'm good, Lord. This is good, I'm here. Thank you, Lord. I can live in the outskirts, I'm good. I'm in your presence, that's enough. Can we say amen to that? And then he's gonna give us rewards. And he's saying, look, the sin, sin was judged at the cross, we're forgiven, and at the beam of seats, so our works are tested by fire and rewarded for those which remain. Guys, it's not only what we do, but with what heart we do it. Do you do things to be seen by men? If you do things to be seen by men, the Bible says you've had your reward. Amen? If you only want to serve in a place where people will praise you and notice you, you know, not that there's a line in heaven, but if there were, I have an idea the people at the front of the line are the people that have faithfully served God without anybody ever knowing it. Amen? The lady with the prayer closet where she just prays eight hours a day for people and nobody even knows she does it. Guys, you know, he rewards those openly who serve him in secret. Verse 11, for it is risen, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Instead of worrying about judging somebody else, worry about the fact that you're gonna stand before the Lord one day. Can we say amen to that? Instead of judging someone else's sin, how about I deal with mine? Anybody else here besides me have some own things in their life that they need to deal with? That I need to come before the Lord and say, forgive me, which I say often, how about you? <laughs> Philippians 2 says, Christ emptying himself was obedient unto death, even death on the cross, wherefore God has exalted him and given him the name above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. All will appear before God in humility. No one's gonna stand, I got questions for God, I can't wait. No, you don't. <laughs> Amen? Where's he at? I have questions I need answers to, no. Muhammad bowing to Jesus. Heads of ISIS bowing to Jesus. Hitler bowing to Jesus. Joseph Smith of the Mormon Church bowing to Jesus. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? And guys, as individuals, we should be focused on our relationship with him far more than we're worried about policing everybody else's walk with him. Now I'm not saying there isn't, again, that Matthew 18 interaction, I'm not saying we as a body don't hold each other accountable, we do it in love, we're a family. Verse 12, so then each of us shall give account of himself to God, again, this is the Bema seat. I will give account before God for my faithfulness to the calling he's placed upon my life. How have I used the gifts he's given me? How have I been, what kind of steward have I been with the finances? What kind of uh, man, what kind of husband, what kind of father, what kind of employee, what kind of pastor, what kind of neighbor? I'll be responsible for what I've done and you'll be responsible for what you've done. And I should be focused on my own walk and let God deal with my brother, amen? But I think too often, people involved in legalism are more concerned about being right 
and correcting everyone else than they are their own walk with the Lord. Oh my goodness, we have eight minutes. Let's start. Don't stumble your brother over doubtful things. So don't, have, don't be legalistic and point fingers, but don't be also have license where you stumble your brother. Don't use your personal liberty as an excuse to stumble your brother. Verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount explained, uh, means judging others according to a standard that we would not want to have applied to ourselves. Amen? Judge others the way you want to be judged. Don't throw a stumbling block in front of your brother. Don't use your license as an opportunity to do what you want without any concern about how it impacts other people. It doesn't take away the need and responsibility for admonishment or rebuke as we talked about. So what's a stumbling block? It's when the st- stronger, more mature brother stumbles a weaker by exercising their liberty in Christ. Again, my pastor friends with beer and smoking a cigar on, on, on Facebook. And I'm like, now, again, but I'm like, bro, I get it, and that's between you and the Lord. When you put it on Facebook, you're letting everybody know that you're a pastor and you like to drink. And now, again, that might stumble. Do you think that might stumble a few folks? People that have a problem with that? Verse 14. I know and am convinced by Lord Jesus that there is nothing unlaw- unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Through the knowledge of Christ as a mature believer, he knew that meat wasn't unclean. But at the same time, it isn't what goes into, again, into your mouth that defiles you. The Lord says, rise, kill, and eat. But as a mature believer, uh, Paul had knowledge of the truth. And he didn't want to stumble his brother by using liberty that he knew he had in Christ. If I do this and it stumbles somebody, then it is sin. Can we say amen to that? If I use my freedom that I feel like I have in Christ, and I've got somebody who's young in their faith, and it's going to cause them to stumble, then I'm outside of God's will. Verse 15. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Can we say amen to that? If he's grieved because of, of what you're eating, now I know we have some Russians in here. I love you guys. I love all of you. I've been to Russia seven times, and Olga challenges me that I've just eaten the wrong Russian food. food. But you know, you get invited to somebody's house, and I would minister to people all day, and then I'd go into somebody's house, and a lot of times they were very poor, and then they would give you the best that they had, and it was just wrong. I remember one time it was a piece of bread with this margarine about an inch thick with some sardines on top of it. There you go. And I ate it with a smile on my face. <laughs> Why? Because to them they were blessing me and the last thing I wanted to do was stumble them over some stupid food that doesn't matter. Does that make sense? So I don't want to eat something that's going to stumble somebody and I also don't want to not eat it because it might stumble them, because to them they want to bless me. I want to share the gospel with them. So what they put in front of me, now again, I'd also have them put vodka in front of me. No. Hey, I appreciate it. I I just don't drink alcohol, but thank you. Be kind. Amen? We're putting alcohol in front of me. What's wrong with you, wine bibber? No, don't do that. (laughs) Amen? Be kind, be loving, be gracious. You know, love people. Show show them the love of Christ. Do not destroy with food the one for whom Christ died. Amen to that. Don't destroy with beer. Don't destroy with your source of entertainment. Don't destroy with material possessions. Avoid the appearance of evil. Don't stumble your brother. You know, as a pastor, I think about where I live, the clothes I wear, the car I drive. I don't want, you know, these guys driving a Rolls Royce and living in a mansion. That stumbles people, and it should. Amen? And we should be thoughtful and mindful of what we do and how we live and what we have as not to be more worried about someone's eternity than my comfort. Can we say amen to that? Let's finish up. Verse 16. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen to that. Our liberty and freedom from the law in Christ is good, but if we use our freedom to destroy a brother in Christ, it is evil. 
If we place food and drink before righteousness and joy in the Holy Spirit, then we are hopelessly out of touch with God's priorities and his heart, placing doubtful things above sharing the love, peace, and grace of God. Guys, it's not about the externals. It's about the eternals. Verse 18, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. You'll be acceptable to God and approved by men if you focus not on meat or drink or controversies or confrontations, but righteousness, peace, and joy, and esteem others greater than yourself. If you're more concerned about others feeling comfortable and loved and cared for than you are your own comfort, you'll be esteemed both by God and men. Verse 19. Then he says, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for a man who eats with offense. He says there it's evil. So even though I have the freedom to do it, if I knowingly do it, and I know it's gonna cause someone else to stumble, the one I'm doing is evil and it's wrong. Amen? Is the point being driven home here? Guys, well, I'm, I have liberty in Christ. I can do whatever I want. I have liberty. And I have people tell me that. And whenever they tell, it's like the person who says, don't judge me. The guy who says, I got liberty. You know what that means? I want to live a sinful life and still go to heaven. When they espouse that over and over again, I'm in liberty, pastor. Don't be talking to me. I, I got liberty. Ran into a guy who I, who I knew was a believer and he was so drunk he couldn't walk and he's trying to tell me he had liberty. I said, bro, you ain't got no liberty to be drunk, bro. Amen? You don't have liberty to be drunk. You don't. Love you, praying for you. You don't have liberty to do that. Don't use it. Do not cover up your sin with the grace of God to say it's okay for me to sin. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Certainly not. Amen? Shall we continue so that, well, I'm under grace so I can sin. Guys, be careful. You're a happy man when your heart doesn't condemn, condemn you, when you realize you've been forgiven. You're walking in grace. Liberty in Christ has set you free from bondage. It says there in verse 21 and 22, it is neither meat nor drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is the one who does not condemn himself and what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. We cannot do it in faith then we are acting, that we are acting in obedience to the word of God and then the conviction of the Holy Spirit, then it's sin. I want to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit in everything I do. Amen? I want to be sensitive when I'm car shopping. Is this what God wants me to do? Can we say amen to that? Amen. I want to be sensitive in the house that I buy. I want to be sensitive in the way that I live and how I spend my time. I want to be sensitive with the Lord knowing I have a vapor of time to serve him and I want to be about it for his kingdom. I want to be sensitive to the gifts God's given me to use them for his glory. Can we say amen to that? So the point here is, as we're living the Christian life, is to walk in unity. Let me close with this. Often you meet somebody that maybe has some different beliefs than you do, but they believe the central tenets of the faith. But they may have some other things they disagree on. You know what I love to do? Start with what we have in common. Amen? Someone will, I'll meet somebody, oh, I'm, you know, I'm with this church, and I'm like, great, you, then you believe in Jesus, absolutely. You believe he died on the cross, I do. You believe that he rose from the dead, I do. You believe that only through him we're saved, amen. You're my brother, praise God. Amen? Well, I hear you guys you know, play drums and worship, and that's from the devil. <laughs> I've been told that. You Calvary guys, you play drums, you know those beats come from the devil, you know that, right? That's from the devil. Oh, I'm gonna pray for you. A lot of unity in that conversation. Guys, let's not focus on non-essentials that divide us. Let's focus on the centrality of Jesus Christ that unites us. Amen. Can we say amen to that? So. Walking in unity, ministering to the weaker brother. Two major sources, legalism, self-righteously turning a personal conviction into a requirement for salvation for everyone else. The second one is license or liberty, allowing personal liberty to become a stumbling block for a weaker brother or sister. Lord, help us. Amen? Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you, Lord. You are indeed a great and an awesome God. I pray we would live every day in the fullness of your Holy Spirit, walking in the truth, 
desiring to honor you and to be an encouragement to others. Lord, may we be more focused on people than our freedoms. May we have a desire, Lord, to be, walk in unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to focus more on what unites us than what divides us. And Lord, at the same time, may we never water down the word of God. May we never make excuses for our own sin, but may we walk in obedience to you. Lord, we love you, we praise you. You're a great and awesome God. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. let's stand and close the worship song.